thrilled that Joe was able to come and be with us tonight, and I don't even have a Bible for him. That's how unprepared I am, but he has assured me that he will tell you all about himself, and uh, will also tell you about uh, Mr. Ed Miner. Great, thank yeah, you very thank much. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate you uh, being here. I, I do notice that in case I lie about anything on my bio, autobiography, there are people in the audience who can correct that. <laughs> there, there were witnesses, but there's nothing in writing. Uh, I am Joe Knappen. I am the second uh, child of Bill and Mickey Knappen. We grew up uh, mostly on the west side of Sturgeon Bay, but we also grew up in the Schofield House. So we were very uh, honored that we did not do any damage to the beautiful woodwork that's in that building. The guys that put that together did a terrific job, and the people who bought it from my dad and uh, reconditioned it as a bed and breakfast really maintained the quality. It's, it's really typical of the art that this community is capable of, especially from the craft side. Um, I was born and raised in Sturgeon Bay. I worked in the family bakery when it was my turn to, to be able to go and burn some bread and learn how to do all the tricks that that Grandpa bought over from Holland. He came over just before World War I. The Queen had offered him a job as a uh, pastry chef, uh, but he declined the position because he would have had to change his religion. He preferred to stick with his faith, and he came to this country. Uh, he followed his brother-in-law, who happened to be one of the White Fathers down in uh, at St. Norbert's. He was one of the first uh, boys to graduate as a priest there, and uh, he started his ministry with all the little Belgian churches down down in Southern Door. He was one of the guys that was sent over to help save those Belgians from going astray. You know how they are. <laughs> I'm half Belgian because Grandma, Grandpa, I can't, you know, Grandpa found Grandma. She was down in Brussels. It was a great deal. Anyway, but the thing that got me here is Ed Miner. I discovered Ed Miner when I was doing um, Civil War reenactments with my relatives. They had uh, relatives who had served in the Civil War. One died at Andersonville. One was killed at uh, Gettysburg. Those are only two of the 600,000 people who died in four years. Four years of the Civil War killed 600,000 people. I don't know. As we're doing these reenactments, we talk about uh, we're not playing cowboys. We're not making mock. We're not having fun. We're trying to honor the people that that did the service, that gave us the values that we have as a country, who preserved the values that we have as a country. And so we, take their, we took our war seriously. And I thought, well, as long as I'm doing serious war, I should do a warrior that I know. And my research led me to Ed Miner. And I want anybody who's ever been in North County, please raise your hand if you know Ed Miner. Oh. Ed Miner is the only Door County man ever elected to Congress. The 8th District has the same boundaries it has now, Appleton, Green Bay, Shano. Ed Miner is the only guy that ever did it. He ran in 1894, and he served until 1907. His political career is bracketed by war. Let me back up a little bit. Ed Miner was born and raised in New York, upstate New York. His father was a ship's chandler, caulker. As the industry grew, the settlers came west. And as they came west, the Miner family came with them, first to Milwaukee. And then they sent young Ed Miner, he was 15. They put him on a boat and sent him to Bailey's Harbor and told him to find land. And he found land walking across the peninsula toward Fish Creek through snowdrifts five and six feet deep. And he found a spot for his family behind what is now the settlement court you know, those, those shops there. And uh, that's where the, the Miner family started. They were related to the St. Orts. The St. Orts had a business there. They had land there. And uh, the Miners got involved in the, in the grocery store or a ship's, uh, call it hardware store today, but it was really a ship's chandlery that handled the accessories for the boats. Well, Ed was just old enough that when Abe Lincoln was elected president in 1860, and put out a call for how many thousand men to save the Union, Ed said, put me on a list. And he walked, that's all he had, he got a horse or he walked. 
He walked to Fond du Lac, which is about 90 miles. He walked to Fond du Lac and he joined up. And he got there in time to join the 2nd Wisconsin Cavalry. The boss in charge was a gentleman named Cadwalder Washburn, who later got to be a, a governor of Wisconsin. These guys didn't get there in time to go out east for all those big fancy battles, Gettysburg and Antietam and all those places where thousands and thousands of people were killed. They ended up going down to Mississippi ahead of uh, General Grant and some of those uh, different officers who were trying to contain the South, keep it from crossing the Mississippi, keep it into, without spreading into Texas and, and uh, Kansas and Nebraska. So Ed Miner served as a, as a cavalryman, a horseman, uh, in several, uh, several battles, several conflicts. Uh, so some of them were just fights in uh, Missouri and Arkansas and Tennessee. And he got promoted. He was a good soldier. He started off as a private. And when he was drummed out, he was uh, a brevet captain, which means he had the authority of the captain, but not the pay. No. <laughs> When he, he was drummed out in, in 1865, at the end of the war, he was in Texas. He was working for a guy named Custer. George Armstrong Custer was such a jerk that the soldiers from Iowa and Wisconsin fought each other for the right to kill him. <laughs> Fortunately, the war ended. Custer went west. He survived for another 10 years. 1876, he was done. The Indians found him. Ed Miner went home. But Ed Miner went home with something most of the men didn't take with them. Ed Miner went home with a reputation. He earned a reputation in 1864 when he was out on patrol with two other troopers. And they came across a guy with his pockets stuffed full of money. Well, back in those days, if you were soldiering and you were getting $1,000 a year, that was a lot. The guy with money in his pockets offered Ed $5,000 if he'd let him go. Well, there you go. Eight years paid. Take the money and run, Ed. Ed said, nope, you're going to jail. He took the guy to jail, and the next day as Ed was going back to work, there was the guy walking in the street. Somebody else took the money, and Ed said, I, I, still, got, I still got Ed Miner. That reputation for honesty, that integrity helped him when he got home. He resumed the work in his family store in Fish Creek. That wasn't going so well, so they moved down to Sturgeon Bay. They're operating out of the back of what is now, uh, oh, it used to be the, I, I want to get to be an old timer. It used to be this, and it used to be there. And if you want to get there, you go to where that old place burned out. <laughs> There's a, a drugstore facing the Prangy building, if you got that. Okay. That burned out, and he needed a job. So his friend said, hey, look, we just got this canal thing going here. How about if we give you that job? And so he managed the canal once it got started. And you had to arrange to have tugs get the ships in, because the ships couldn't sail that, that little narrow strip. That was 100 feet wide and, what is it, a quarter mile long? So he needed to arrange that, and he needed to collect fees. The railroad company owned it, so they were really making it good. They wanted to get a railroad up here. The railroad owned the, the canal. They were really controlling shipping rates. Well, Ed thought that, uh, you know, hey, this is really good, but I can do more for my community. And his friends thought so too. And with his reputation for honesty, they elected him to the state assembly. Well, that's pretty cool. He served three or four terms in the state assembly. And he served three or four more terms in the state senate. You have to understand that in the 1860s and 70s and 80s, being in the state assembly meant some really important things. He was part of the legislation that bought the land that guaranteed Highway 42 would come into 47 south of Sturgeon Bay. He was part of the legislation that made sure there was a telephone that went to Washington Island. He was part of the legislation that made sure that Washington Island was determined a terminus. That way state and federal money could go into the transportation corridor to pay for roads and boats and so on. He paid, he was part of the legislation that got all kinds of docks and riprap and all those kinds of things that made this 
seaside community, a functional seaside community. One of the big things that did was to make sure that the veterans got pensions. When he ran for office, I gotta read this because this sounds this this will help explain a lot of politics in Door County. I want to I want to I want to be able to read my notes because if I if I get it wrong, then you're gonna throw rocks and stuff. Uh, no. While I'm while I'm looking. Let me pass this around. This is Ed Miner. About the time he ran for office, that's Ed. About the time of the funeral, that's, that's Ed. This is going to be Ed and his beautiful bride, and we're going to take guesses on who she might be. I'll, I'll save these two for a minute. Uh, okay. Now y'all got to pretend that it's July 7th, 1894. We're in Stevens Point, and those big shots from Appleton want their Democrat to win again. <coughs> We've had several terms with this guy. So Republicans got together, and they nominated Ed Miner. And Ed looked around the room and he said, oh, look at this. We have people of business. We have lawyers. We have merchants. We have all these people. Look at the diversity of our group. And even in that diversity, we share common values. You all understand, as businessmen, merchants, lawyers, doctors, you understand that if you don't meddle in government, Government is going to meddle in your business until it's not worth a penny. And that got him a lot of votes. He ran a campaign based on three very important things. They were still fighting the gold speech and all of that good stuff at the time. They wanted to have money backed by real stuff. You've got to have gold or you've got to have silver. He was all for that. He wanted to have a protective tariff, but he wanted the voters to understand that the tariff was not all there to allow business to make money. The tariff was there to make sure that business was strong enough to provide jobs. We want our people to work. That's what this is all about. And finally, the government is supposed to provide pensions to its veterans. Think about it. Without the veteran, you have nothing. Nothing that you have would be there. So the veteran is entitled to everything that he is by right and by law entitled to. And I still think that that's true. I think that those are some of the things that still fly in, in politics in Door County. Uh, some of those, some of you, there might be one or two of you older than me, but not very many. And if you look back, what are the politics of Door County? Politics of Door County, at least for federal offices and the, the local town and, and county offices, was Rock Rib Republican from 1894 until about the late 90s, early 2000s. That's when some of the part-time residents started to move up there and they brought their politics with them. And you got a mix of Republicans and Democrats that you have today. Um, without the mix and the diversity that's brought by our visitors every year, our politics would be 1894 Ed Minor. Which isn't bad, but it doesn't include everybody. That's just my lesson from Ed Miner. When Ed was in in the army, I don't know how much they talked. I, I wasn't there, but this gentleman was. What's that man's name? William uh, Brisbane. William Brisbane is born and raised in South Carolina. He's a slave owner. By the time he was 40, he decided that there was something really immoral about slavery. So he sold his, he got rid of his slaves. He didn't sell them, he got rid of them. And then he thought, oh, those poor slaves, they don't know how to do anything, they don't have anything. So he went back and got all his slaves and went to Ohio and bought them some land and helped them start their own lives. 
Now let's head William Brisbane. William Brisbane fits into this story because he was the chaplain in the 2nd Wisconsin Cavalry. Believe it or not, he came from South Carolina, moved his former slaves to Ohio, and then landed in Madison, Wisconsin as the pastor of a Baptist church in the 1880s. Can you believe that? Can't believe that. I don't know how much contact he had with the men. If he was like the chaplains that I served with, he was poking his nose in our business all the time. And maybe, maybe he was one of the guys that was able to straighten out some of the men in the second Wisconsin about what slavery was about, what the war was about, all those kinds of things. I mentioned Cat Walter Washburn. He's in this photo. There's a picture of the, the staff of the second Wisconsin. Washburn got to be a governor a few years after the war. But there again, there's a man who had made a reputation for himself, not only among his troops, but with General Grant and General Sherman. So when they needed something done in that area of the battle, they knew who they could call on. Now, Ed, Ed did all these things. And he, in Congress, even, he did more. Uh, he knew from his experience in the Wisconsin legislature that canals were worth a ton of money. They were worth more than that. They were worth lives and jobs. So when the opportunity came to buy the Panama Canal, he encouraged President Roosevelt. He helped support that program, get that canal built, because he had seen what a canal built did in Sturgeon Bay, connecting Lake Michigan and Sturgeon Bay, cutting short the trip between the, the forests and the mines and the factories. You save the guys money, they can make more money than everybody can get jobs. That worked well. At the same time, the Suez Canal was opening, and that showed the same kind of uh, economic boost for Europe and India and the Orient. So when the opportunity came to do the Panama Canal, he helped encourage Congress that what you can do is solve the problems that the French couldn't, and you can get that ditch dug. They got that done. One of his jobs was to set the manning on the ships of regulations about everything in the government. And, and regulating ships was huge because ships were going from wind power to steam power. You need a different number of men doing different kinds of jobs, and he helped organize that in the federal regulations. He also took several trips down south because they were fighting over how big of a state New Mexico could be. Well, they decided it would be really simple. Put the ax to her, you have two states. It's New, New Mexico and Arizona. He also helped arbitrate the land battles in Oklahoma. They weren't uh, handled very fairly. The indigenous folks really got, got took. But all those land grabs, you'll see movies or you'll read stories about the land grabs, come and get free land on the government. Uh, you can own as much land as your horse can ride in a day, all that kind of stuff. He helped organize those things. So when you hear about those kinds of things, those are, that's what legislators are supposed to do. I look around, I look at Madison, and I look at Washington, and I'm waiting for somebody to do something. Not seeing Ed Miner coming out of that. Anyway, Ed, Ed did his bit. Um, after he was unelected, he came home, and his, his neighbors made him postmaster, which is a pretty reputable job, and that was great. He had already served almost every other political position in, in in Sturgeon Bay and Door County. And then all of a sudden, there came a war. Uh, he was still in Congress when the Spanish-American War was fought, and he helped support that for just one reason. He wanted to see the country's regions come back together and fight as one. Could the North and the South function under a unified command? Could they put aside Gettysburg and Antietam and all the rest of it and, and fight for their country, and they did. They had good leadership, and they fought. A few years later, they called Ed out of retirement to get him and said, Ed, you got to be mayor, because all the men went to France. <laughs> well, that was World War I, the Great War, the war to end all war, and there were no men around to run for office. And of course, women couldn't vote. That wouldn't come until after Ed was, Ed was in the ground. We corrected that mistake, and I think we've done a little bit better since. <laughs> After his term was up and the war was over, Ed just kind of retired to, to Sturgeon Bay. He had some land up north. He had a little Stanley steamer car up there, and he'd drive his grandkids around. About that time, one of his daughters married a, a Yule from uh, the Boston area, 
Now, unfortunately, the young man got cancer. And in his search for cure, he found the Christian science movement. And his mother really grabbed onto that. But I got to tell you about his mother. Because it sounds so far that Ed Miner is just a workaholic. But Ed Miner is a true love story. When Ed was still working in the family store up in Fish Creek, he'd go skating down the bay, coming down toward uh, Bayshore Park. And there was a guy named Graham there, Robert Graham. He had a mill. He's got a bunch of posters down here on the bay. He was one of the founders of Sturgeon Bay. And he had a daughter. You might see her picture coming around. Tilly Graham was 17, and she was teaching school. And he'd skate down, and he'd say, hi, Tilly. And then when he got, went into the Army, he came down and said, hey, Tilly, you watch my land for me, because when I come home, I'm going to marry you. And she told her friends and her parents, who would ever marry a guy like that? <laughs> well, when he came out, it took him two years, but he convinced her. And they got married. They had six kids. Uh, one of them served as uh, his dad's secretary in Washington, but one of them was the girls who married this Yule boy. And they got behind the Christian science movement. Um, I think it's ahead of my story. Um, well, Ed was retired. He got bored and started going through his papers one day, and he found a poem that he had written to Tilly back when they were courting. And he went down to the advocate office. He said, I want you to publish this. But while he was on his way down, Tilly called the editor and said, don't you dare. Because <laughs> what the poem said, and I can't quote it exactly, but it was to the effect that uh, if, if Tilly had been put in the Garden of Eden first, the devil would have not have got a chance to get through the gate. Oh. <laughs> so much of that is love, but so much of that is Tilly's Ackerman, too. When Ed was in Madison, the state was fighting its battle over, uh, uh, what do you call them? executions. Should we, should we kill bad criminals? And we have not. One. There was one execution in the state. He was a farmer, drowned his wife back in like 1851. In the battle not to allow executions in the state, Tilly, for the first time, stood against her husband. And she campaigned around the state, and she campaigned around the state along with the politicians, and they kept executions from being permitted in Wisconsin. So yeah, maybe Tilly would have been really, really hell on the devil if you be part of that. But that's Ed Miner. And one of the things that gets me about Ed Miner, Ed Miner is a terrific story. He's a terrific story of what, what the opportunities can be for anybody who goes into the military. You don't just go and shoot and do weird stuff. You need to learn skills. You need to learn people. You need to learn to get along and resolve things. You also learn to take advantage of opportunities. When they made Ed the, the manager of the canal, not only did he arrange all these uh, tows, but he got himself a couple of tugboats and taught his sailors to sail out quick and be the first one to get the tow in and get the fee. So he was always finding opportunities. <laughs> and he knew his faith. He'd heard about this Christian science movement from his wife. And after he died and she died, it became the Christian science room, 212 South 7th Avenue. When you come off the bridge, you're looking right at that big white, big white house. And that's where the, the Christian science group met even until I think two or three years ago they just finally sold the place. I was privileged to give an Ed Miner presentation in the house. The house that built, Ed built in the 1860s. And you know he's walking the walls. But he never promoted the, that faith. He always went to Reverend Gronfeld over at the Hope United Congregationalist Church, that little old white church long gone now. And uh, Gronfeld did the funeral. When, when Ed died, Door County people appreciate this. The Door County League, for the only time in its history, delayed the games. They would not play ball until Ed was in the ground. So he must have meant something to the people of Door County. He also was credited with shaping the politics and the social life and the uh, uh, 
I don't know, moral code of Door County for almost 100 years. And I think that that stands the test of time. It's unfortunate there is no plaque, there's no statue of Ed Miner. 7th Avenue used to be Miner Street, mm -hmm. but no more. Now it's 7th since the 1940s. I think that yeah, all of us need to know, know or I always tell my, my family and my friends, do your family history. You don't know what's in there. You might have it Ed Miner. Mm -hmm. You might have more than that. So if you don't know, your kids won't know, your grandkids won't know. Tell the stories. You got a great idea for a book for a society. The stories need to be told so people know who are your heroes, what are your values, and why do we have the values that we have. That's it, Minor. Okay. Right, Anybody have any questions? Anything I can help you with? No? Good. Well, I have a question. Sure. It's, it's not quite related, but it has something to do with the Civil War. Sure. And you seem to be somewhat of a local historian. And I was always curious about that cemetery. It's over where Savage and the restaurant used to be. It's called the White Gullet, or the White Church, West Virginia. There's a little cemetery there with a sign that says, Gone but not forgotten. Right. And most of the graves there, uh, most of the graves right now, they can't even locate most of them. Right. But there's two graves there that are from Civil War veterans. Correct. Do you know anything about that? About the mid-90s, late 1990s, there were other people who noticed what you noticed, that there is a, a location for a cemetery. And at that time, the, uh, the graves were deteriorating and they were sinking into the ground. You could pick out the rectangles. Cemetery was formed. If Harold Forbes and the local foundation has got their information correct, the cemetery was formed as kind of a potter's field. I think there's a Chinese man and there might be one or two black people who were buried there in the 1800s. But also there are some veterans, and there are a couple of them uh, whose stones were reset by the Spooty family, so they're on solid stones and they're well displayed. So I think there's another one. And that could well be. That could well be. They found what they could find. So they didn't know what to mark because they didn't have names for most of them. But the ones that they did have, I think there are like four stones or three stones at the back of it. And those have those. I was interested in the two, uh, the two yeah, Civil War graves. Absolutely. Yeah, we lost, we lost some guys in the Civil War. There's no doubt about that. Check that. I, I should have the number at the top of my head. But check the uh, the uh, the big plaque, the big monument down in front of City Hall. They've got the names of all the guys from all the wars. And we read them every every Veterans Day. We read our Memorial Day. We read those those names. Those guys made it for us. You know, I think I think he's right about that. Without veterans, what would you have? I'm praying about Israel right now. Without veterans, what would they have? Everybody in that country is a veteran. Can our kids say that? I mentioned, I mentioned Veterans Day. We did a, a Veterans Day program. We do them uh, at the, each high school we rotate. Uh, this year's Sebastopol's turn. A few years back, uh, we were hosted by Southern Door. And Tom Van Leeshout was the former superintendent, and he gave a really great speech. And after he paid tribute to the guys from World War II and Korea and Vietnam and the war on terror, he turned and he faced his student body. Okay, kids, that's what they did. What are you going to do when it's your turn? And that, that's a question that, that scares me a little bit. Because I, I helped, uh, helped teach some of those kids, and they're not sure what war Vietnam is in or if it had its own war. They're not sure what their great war was or why they were fighting. We got, we got to teach our kids better than what we have been. Not so much the necessity of the war, but the values. We got kids that go to football games that can't stand up for a Star Spangled Banner. Well, excuse me. <laughs> Every time that happened to me in class, they paid dearly for it. I gave them 10 minutes on the flight. <laughs> so, <laughs> but anyway, yeah, thank you very much. That's, that's a neat thing. That's a, another, you know, ask the local questions because you don't know what the story is. Sure. Not the same time, there's a small cemetery outside the other one, and it has a gravestone for a woman named 
I worked at the Advocate for 30 years. I've never heard that one. Yeah. Somebody's got to educate me. It's just a small grave still that's just uh, a graveyard, and, and I just happen to see it. It is with some Civil War gravestones, but it's a niece of Abraham Lincoln. And it could be a joke. There's all kinds of things that happen. Anyway, I'm sorry, Steve, what do you got? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure a bunch of people in this room know, but I have never known. When and why did all the street names in Sturgeon Bay change? 1947. All those streets had different names. Memorial Drive was Memorial Drive as a memorial to World War I. Uh, memorial Field was a memorial to veterans. In 1947, the real world caught up with <coughs> the hodgepodge way we had of naming things. And Door County is a small example. Try and rename, you know, keep track of the streets in New York or Chicago. You can't be kidding me. <laughs> so there was, I believe, a federal, a federal law that went through that, to the best of your ability, you're supposed to follow that uh, township and range arrangement and do one, two, three north and one, two, three south, A, B, C north, A, B, C yeah, south. So you'll see Michigan Street's kind of the dividing line. Yes. If you start up there, what is it? A, B, C, D is Delaware, oh, yeah, yeah. Delaware, Erie, Florida, California. Yeah. But you get down to Memorial Drive coming back this way, then it's Utah and R and S coming. Yeah, but the street near me is from the state of Quincy. That's a president. <laughs> but if you can't find, if you can't find a, a state, find a president. <laughs> on, on the west side, it's trees and generals, or trees and famous people. Oh, okay. So you look at Elm, but then you look at Elm and Maple going one way, and Lansing is an uh, old governor, I think. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you kind of got to fight that one out. Yes, sir. So this is uh, not a question, but just a point of information. Sir. Sure. If you want to, if you, there are some remnants of the old street names that are still left. Yes, sir. And if you get into the old parts of Sturgeon Bay, but they haven't torn up the old sidewalks yet. Oh, I've seen you, that. You yeah. go with, you will right. find the old street names in the corner right. of Sykes, yeah. you can the church, the church Street. The Church Street, yeah. Fifth yeah. Avenue is all Church Street yeah. because there's so many churches running from one end to the other. And I hope they never turn those sidewalks up. Yeah. 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 They got a few of them. They got a few of them. The museum did a program on that, the Dora County Historical Museum, did the research and saved as many of those as they could. So if you want more information, do run to the, well, I think they're closed now, but you could email them. Um, you can email Stephen Rice, and he would be able to get you the information of what the old street name was and what it is now. Great. <laughs> Got lots of ideas for <coughs> programs around here. There's lots of local history. But good luck. Thank you very much for having me.